In this video, you'll learn how some of the top biotech venture capitalists in the world evaluate companies and get their advice on how to successfully raise money as a biotech startup. We have an amazing panel of biotech VCs who will introduce themselves in more detail in the video, but by almost any objective measure, these are some of the best biotech investors in the world. And they don't just fund companies, they're company builders who founded startups that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars, been acquired by big companies, and gone public. So a quick overview of the agenda before we jump in. First, the panel will introduce themselves, and then we have two mock pitches. We've made up two hypothetical companies, and one of the panelists will play the role of CEO of the hypothetical company and present to the rest of the panel. So these are meant to be educational. The pitches will have some good elements and some not so good elements. The goal is to help you understand how investors evaluate companies and illustrate some common pitching pitfalls to avoid. And then at the end of the pitches, the rest of the panel will provide their feedback and we'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the companies and the pitches. And then after that, we'll wrap up with a discussion of fundraising best practices and Q&A. So without further ado, let's jump into the video. I worked at uh, Longitude Capital, Capital and uh, I am now at Epirium, which is one of the companies uh, I've uh, helped uh, restructure and uh, put together and uh, 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 led the syndication uh, with uh, Arch Venture. Can you hear me on this one? Yeah. All right, here's a sad one. Okay. <laughs> Um, so Mira Trusha, I'm a principal at 5AM Ventures, a uh, scientist by training. So prior to 5AM, I spent 15 years in various academic and industry labs uh, in a variety of, of areas, including gene therapy, herpes infections, which at least enables you to talk to your family about what you do in a very approachable way, um, <laughs> antibiotic resistance and, and oncology. Uh, came to 5AM about four and a half years ago and have been investing uh, with them ever since. I'm JJ Kong. Uh, I'm a partner at the Column Group. I did my undergrad at Harvard in Chemistry, uh, Chemical Biology at Caltech for my PhD. And uh, I worked at Fibrogen, which is actually a local uh, biotech company uh, that's public now in Mission Bay Area. Um, uh, there I did project management and drug discovery and development, as well, well as uh, corporate strategy. I joined Column Group in 2015, and I've been there since, uh, and uh, started three companies there, uh, Tanaya Therapeutics, Exonix Therapeutics, and uh, uh, Essient Pharmaceuticals. I'm Sarah Bagat. I'm, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, I'm a principal at Sofanova. I was a neuroscientist for uh, 10 years before I joined, started my career at Mass General doing clinical trials in psychiatry, was at Rockefeller before doing my PhD in neuroscience at Yale, and then did a brief postdoc at Stanford, and actually did a fellowship with Keenan along the way um, before I landed at Stanford, obviously, as it's long at Sofanova, unfortunately. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, even more. Um, so I've been at Sofanova now for three years. We focus mostly on therapeutics, and we also invest in more late stage, clinical stage companies. Sarah was the best, just for everyone to know. So, um, uh, hi guys, my name is Julie Grant. Uh, I've, I'm a partner at Canaan. I have been with Canaan for about six and a half years. Um, my my background, I studied biophysics and biochem at Yale, and um, uh, got a master's at Cambridge, and then went straight into industry. So I, I worked at Genentech, managing preclinical to phase two cross-functional teams, primarily in oncology. Um, for those of you who are really jazzed about commercial, uh, got to work on growth hormone, which um, super sexy, right, in the Genentech franchise. Uh, it turns out it teaches you how uh, drug development, actually how you get paid, so that was useful. Um, so rebating, contracting, discounting, negotiating with Florida Blue Cross, exciting times. So um, moved over to commercial, worked on the commercial team for Tarsiva, uh, and then Roche bought Genentech, and I became the lead market planner for new oncology products. Um, at Canaan, I, right now, I'm mainly focused on new company formation, but really focus on Series A deals and incubation, and I uh, really hope to work with these people a lot during my career. So thank you for showing up. Thank you. So now we will play a little bit of musical chairs. Yeah. 
Just a minute. So now I'm like... Okay. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Great. So very excited today to tell you a little bit about GTX Therapeutics. This is a fake company. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, okay. So we are focused on developing a novel platform um, to develop novel uh, capsids that are optimized for treating severe neurological disorders. So as we know, there are a number of severe neurological disorders with a strong genetic link, but delivery is an issue, right? So small molecules, which can easily pass through the blood-brain barrier, lack functionality of proteins. And then on the flip side, proteins and cells have, can't always cross the blood-brain barrier. And so it seems that gene therapy would be the right modality as it can enable protein therapy in the CNS. And there has been proof of concept in the clinic that gene therapy has shown promise in some of these CNS indications like spinal muscular atrophy, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide. And so here, AAV9 um, is a capsid that shows great targeting of motor neurons, um, but it comes with a number of limitations. So intravenous um, administration requires a high dose, so a lot of manufacturing costs associated with it, and also some off-target effects. For example, there are some uh, issues with liver tox and also targeting of, non, uh, of cells that you may not want to target for protein expression. So we think there's room to make a much better platform to identify capsids that have better blood-brain barrier permeability, better potency, and cell type and uh, tissue uh, specificity. So there has been great progress in this space. We know Zolgensma, which is Avexis's um, AV9, was approved was kind of was the first approved AV9 gene therapy for monogenic CNS disorder. Um, this is a uh, going after a spinal muscular atrophy which is a disorder where there is a mutation in the SMN1 gene, which produces a decreased expression of the protein SMN. This is a very severe neurological disorder that results in a progressive loss of muscular function. These patients, uh, especially type 1 patients, will typically require um, continuous ventilation by age 2 or um, unfortunately die. And so AV, uh, so. AVXS101 is a potential cure for SMA, and they've shown in clinical trials in patients zero to two that it actually restores motor function. So in some ways, this has been a huge, um, a huge step forward in this space for um, improved treatment for these types of monogenic disorders, but there are also some drawbacks with the existing therapy and limitations to bring, these a bring AAV9 into other indications. So for one, we know that AV9 transduces liver and other organs, requiring higher dosing, manufacturing um, becomes kind of a rate-limiting step and, and cost, but also toxicity. So we know that in some of the earlier phase one studies, uh, there was an elevation of liver enzymes, um, and even in the label, there's a warning for um, acute uh, um, liver injury as well. And we think that this is related to the vector itself. It also has uh, limited brain tropism and cell type specificity. So again, issues with kind of dosing patients at high volumes, um, manufacturing, and um, being able to get expression in other cell types, that could be a limiting factor for other indications. So from that, GTX Therapeutics uh, is, has used and developed a very novel um, directed evolution platform to develop uh, better promoters and uh, better, sorry, better um, capsids for increased bl blood brain barrier penetration, um, cell type and tissue specificity, and better potency. And so we've been able to show proof of concept in um, some of the, in mice, for example, where we can have a unique platform to identify a novel promoter system to get cell type specificity in both neuronal and non neuronal populations. So you can see. For example, with some of our vectors, we get great expression in oligodendrocytes um, specifically, and then also some neuronal subpopulations. So for example, we can get um, use a promoter to get expression exclusively into GABAergic neurons, and this would be a great advantage for going after certain types of epilepsy, for example. We also have uh, optimized for liver detargeting, so we get decreased expression into the liver 
we think this will have a better profile for safety and we can get more uh, more virus into the into the brain so this is some of our kind of proof of concept data and as we move forward and think about going after different rare monogenic disorders um, we are thinking about how to ev evaluate and identify what should be sort of our lead indications that we go after. And so we're using a number of these criteria to um, evaluate what should be our first indication in the clinic. And some of those criteria are a significant unmet medical need. We want really clear uh, understanding of biology with targets that are validated. Uh, we don't want to go into spaces that are very competitive as these are rare and smaller patient populations. And we want strong biomarkers and endpoints so we can get a quick objective read of whether or not our therapy is successful in the clinic. So from these sort of uh, initial criteria, we've listed a number of candidates that to go after. And our lead candidate is uh, frontal temporal lobe dementia with patients that have a progranulin um, uh, deficiency. And so from here, we've produced some proof of concept data in uh, a mouse model, and these are mice that are uh, progranulin knockouts. And what we can see that with our vector compared to standard AAV, we get higher expression into the brain. Um, and then under CDA, we could certainly share more uh, cell type specificity and uh, functional uh, benefits as well in these mice. So the goal is to raise a $5 million seed round where we will be able to um, further our preclinical studies in a variety of these um, different uh, di models of neuro neurological disease to scale up manufacturing so we can complete our TOCs and IND enabling studies um, so that we can submit our I IND in the next six to 12 months. And from there, thank you for your time and happy to answer questions. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> As a, we've worked really hard in this company. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, a question would be, when you think about these diseases, so the platform technology, I think it's uh, super differentiating. It's where, you know, where the technology needs to go to address and expand where AAV is and the diseases we can address. It would be great to understand for the diseases you list, and especially the ones you're going to go after first, what do we understand about the competitive landscape? What's available to these patients um, from a small molecule or other perspective and how big the unmet need is so that we'd easily be able to triangulate to um, you know, how, how much room we have to run um, with a new modality like this? That would be a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> I think it would be helpful in the pitch to understand a little bit about the platform, about how yeah. this uh, is going to improve the capsids. Uh, obviously, there's technologies out there already, uh, and certainly the IP position of, of the you know, AV9 out there and, and what have you, but also just your competitive advantage uh, over folks like 4DMP and others. You know, there's a lot of them working on capsids. So I think being able to judge uh, the the kind of mechanistic uh, advantages of your platform over someone else, even though it could be non-confidential, I think that needs to come through a little bit stronger. Absolutely. Um, in your vector tropism slide, if you go back to it. Yeah, thank you. yeah, there. So one of the things that's interesting is the goal is to detarget the liver. In vector one, you show detargeting of the liver, but in reality, it actually has a larger magnitude signal in the brain. So it would be helpful to get an idea of sort of what your therapeutic window target is. Maybe that is enough to, to avoid hepatotoxicity, but it would be helpful to hone in on that one potential feature. And then also the, uh, the budget is a bit thin. So <laughs> what do you mean? Five, $5 million to get through CMC preclinical, yeah. uh, getting ready for your uh, IND enabling studies is, is a bit on the thin side, and timeline is a bit aggressive. <laughs> Um, and the other thing I would add is one of the key pain points for um, gene therapy companies in general is CMC, yeah. and uh, you know your man <laughs> where yeah. you plan to have the manufacturing done and what are your plans over how many years? Yeah, I would say on the same note of budget thin, timeline fast is unbelievably so. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the point. Good. I can also just, um, I think, oh, did we not put that? Oh, sorry. So we wanted to highlight some of the kind of strengths and weaknesses with the presentation to begin with, and we can make this discussion based and others can just chime in. So I think the strengths was identifying, obviously there are huge issues with gene therapy going to CNS right now because delivery is a really significant issue and you're talking about doing systemic administrations and there's a lot of people who question, can you really do this successfully and get enough into the brain and not get toxicity? Um, and so I think that is a huge unmet need and I think this presentation does highlight that. Um, I think obviously there's no detailed information and agreed that even for a non-confidential presentation, if you just come in saying something that 10 other companies are doing and you're not willing to give any additional insights into what you have versus another company, it's really lacking in understanding why should, as an investor, I spend more time and go under CDA if I don't understand what you have that's truly differentiated. Um, and so also doing all these uh, validation pr proof of concept studies in mice for expression are pretty weak in value because there's just not a lot of translatability. You really want to do some of these in non-human primates. And so as an investor, you'd be nervous at the stage that you're currently in. Um, so obviously addressing when will you have some non-human primate data and what will it take to get to that. Um, again, you need to share things. You want to be careful what you share under not, without a CDA, um, especially if you don't have strong IP at that point. But you also, if you can't trust investors to say enough, it, we have personally kind of ended presentations earlier if you're saying, I can't tell you the target because I don't know how to evaluate anything with saying target X and protein Y. Um, so you have to have some comfortability kind of going out there a little bit. No discussion of IP, this is a space where you really are gonna to have to show how your IP will be able to play in an area where there is a lot of existing IP. The time frame and budget were absolutely ridiculous. So you have to sort of, you wanna highlight exactly what is what are some of the talk studies that you need to do. You don't need to give a sort of line by line budget, but you in a, even in a non-confidential presentation, you need to sound credible and what you're asking to raise and what you need to do under what time frame. And time frames add cushion, but not, but then I've seen the other extent where people present things that are so conservative that you get concerned of why would it take this long to get to the end of phase two. So you have to sort of play that and credit, and this speaks to also I think the team's credibility and experience, which is another um, point of how we think through things. And then Obviously, this was incredibly high level, and there wasn't enough kind of conversation about um, getting into the data. Again, you want to balance it if it's a non-confidential deck, but you have to present enough to make, I think, investors want to invest additional time. I don't know if there are other points. Yeah, so uh, at that point, uh, everybody talks about team, team, team. You didn't talk about team. <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, that's a, yeah, no, that's a great point. And team's a huge, huge component for all of us because most of the time whatever a team presents is not where they end up in, in, in give it two months, three months, three years, five years. But uh, yeah, phenomenal teams make all the difference and it's a really important evaluator. So yeah, absolutely team slides are important and discussing the team's background is important. Thanks for attention to how you define what's phenomenal about a team and what's not phenomenal. Yeah. Like, sure, I think it has a lot to do and I think everyone should chime into this because um, yeah. Um, I'll just, I can start quickly as you all sit up here. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> no. Um, so I'd say for us, I mean, because we're later stage investors, I'll sit down after I answer this. Um, because we're later stage investors, you want the right team for the right stage of your company, right? So that's kind of, Im that's important. So teams with a lot of experience who have success, and there's experience in different ways, right? Experience in raising capital and giving successful financial exits, which isn't always the same as developing successful drugs. Companies and teams that have uh, developed drugs for uh, successfully, brought them to approval, did a commercial launch. Uh, so a team that has credibility in that capacity is really important. Um, a team that I think is open to wanting to partner with investors is important. I think we're there to be, 
all these, everyone on this kind of platform here, we are active investors. We don't just write checks and call us when you figure it all out. We want to be helpful. We want to be value add. So teams that I think are open to that feedback are important. And I'll let you guys pick it up from there. You took all of my moderator questions and answers for later. Um, <laughs> that's my only comment. Um, but no, at earlier stage, um, you know, where, where there's a technology platform like this the, and, and we're early stage investors, um, the team may just be, you know, a PI, a paper, some postdocs coming out, and they've spun out, and they understand that technology better than anyone. They can build that platform better than anyone, and, and that's hugely valuable. And then, and then it's how do you build the right team at every stage of a company? So that might be the right seed stage team if we're saying you need to leverage this platform, build some prototype therapeutic products, and get to in vivo proof of concept just generally. Um, once you're raising that Series A and you're making a therapeutic that's going into the clinic, then you know where where Sarah often comes in. Um, you need um, you need a really experienced drug discovery and development team that understands the nuances of manufacturing of regulatory, um, because what you don't want is for a company to fail for a reason that you absolutely could have predicted and understood, right? So um, having teams that have done it before, especially in a regulated environment like this, is is really important. I agree. I agree with everything uh, that was said. I think the uh, only thing I would add is that uh, in addition to looking for executives with you know, strong track records who, who know the field and, and uh, can be good leadership to the company, I think we really stress uh, getting top caliber scientists uh, into the company because they're the ones at the bench doing the work and the rigor and, and creativity that they bring, I think, really kind of makes or breaks your company as far as uh, the very early stages uh, of discovery. And I guess what I wanted to add is that uh, when uh, the company is at a later stage and later stage funds come in, they typically do what is called um, repeat investing with the same kind of team. So there is a dearth. You have to know that there is a dearth of uh, high caliber executives out there. So. Uh, many, many venture funds have gotten burned uh, by giving money to uh, inexperienced teams. And so there's a lot of comfort, both for venture people and Wall Street, when they see uh, folks with really good track record. Uh, so uh, sometimes what I've seen is that scientists, um, they of course um, have great pride, they've developed something wonderful, but they want to hold on to their baby and they would rather be the CEO when they have no experience. And that just, you know, un, you know just cuts away from their value if they were to partner with a really experienced CEO. So uh, that would be um, one point to, to consider when you go out there and, and fund. Yeah, so I think a couple things on feedback. So um, there's constructive feedback associated with how to make a pitch better. There's constructive feedback about the content of science. There's constructive feedback about the nature of the assays you've selected. And there's constructive feedback about team. And all of that can feel super painful. And so I would say um, most VCs, and we were kind of joking about this over in the corner, have received what I will call the crazy breakup email. And it is a four page rebuttal on a decline. And we receive more than you might realize about those. And it makes people never ever want to give feedback ever, ever again. Okay, so um, I think that the narrative and conversation is honestly there are companies and startups and entrepreneurs that we have followed for three years and then we will fund the company. Um, and but I can say that if you send back a 10 line, 20 line, five page email that says you're stupid and here are the 50 reasons why you don't understand science and um, you don't understand what an AAV is, um, we will probably never work with you. And so uh, we are on the phone with our entrepreneurs texting every day for sometimes six to seven years. So we are essentially, we are getting married when we put our money into your company. And so I think that if you approach that with, I will say, these people up here, I think that's actually a lot of the conversation as well, is the, the nature of the relationship is actually very big. And for those of us who are up here, is we are in fact tying our careers to you as well. And I think that's really important to think about. So when we talk about partnership, in fact, I'm tying my track record for the rest of my career as an investor to you. And so uh, I would really just try and take that, that lens as well 
um, as when we think about feedback, when we think about relationship, when we think about repeat entrepreneurs, when we think about um, taking people out of companies we've backed before and putting them into the CEO position, CSO position, which they've never had. Um, and we will track people for decades. And so I, I think we really do try to play a long game in this and, um, and would love to build those relationships with you guys. So. Uh, so for, um, for giving feedback, um, sometimes we are, um, you know, pr we, we sometimes make calls so that people know that we, we were serious, we considered uh, the, um, uh, the investing opportunity and uh, we can provide uh, very limited feedback for all the reasons that, that were, were mentioned. Um, and uh, what one thing we do mean uh, is uh, let's keep in touch. Uh, and uh, no hard feelings because uh, sometimes we track an investment for about two, three, four years before we make it. Actually, for Ethereum, the company that uh, that I joined, um, the Patrick, the, the the founder of Longitude, he tracked it for five years before we made the investment. And had they not had a good relationship and you know come back and give us updates and understood that uh, the risk profile wasn't right for us at that time you know, would have made, never made the investment. So just keep in touch and, and uh, uh, consider the risk profile of your um, um, opportunity versus where the fund is. Nothing, nothing to add there. Agree with everything. Uh, uh, I'll add just one thing, which is, you know, every fund's model is different uh, and their philosophies are different. And so I think for us, when we uh, pass on an investment, it can just be that it's not a fit, um, and that's not necessarily a negative to uh, the deal that was presented. You just have to, it is kind of building a relationship, it's kind of like dating, you have to find, uh, find the right fit. Yeah, and just to touch on that, actually, uh, just because you pass at one stage doesn't mean a, comp a VC isn't gonna be interested at a later stage. So certain firms will be focused on you know, investing in a company that gets through clinical data. Others will be more comfortable investing earlier and building sort of the, the core culture. And so we might see a company, think that the team is great and the science is great, it's just a little bit too early, we'll pass in one round, but be eager to catch up in two years, hear the pitch when the story's matured, pay more in terms of a valuation perspective because the, the opportunity's been more de-risked, and then come in at a later stage so it's not really a permanent pass, at least it, you know, in our firm ever. It's just you know, let us know when you have more data, the story's a bit more mature. Well, so I guess the ethos that I operate by, and I think everybody does, is that um, everybody deserves a response. Whether it's a, a yes, a no, um, nobody should be left hanging, right? Ghosting doesn't work anywhere. Um, and so it is our, it's always at least my goal to, and I think my firm's and everybody's firm's goals to get back to everybody. In some cases, I'll give a lot of feedback because I'm really interested in where they might be in six months. and. And I want to make sure that whatever they're doing in the next six months matches with where I think they could be. And they don't have to take my feedback. They could do something totally different, and then it still wouldn't be an opportunity. But, but maybe they're going to get very similar feedback from other VCs, and we've often gotten that, and it's come back in six months uh, you know, with some more proof of concept data. And, and we're early stage venture, so six months is a, is a lifetime. Um, and so and we'll make the investment there. And then in other cases, it's just really clear that something's not a strategic fit because you know, we don't do clinical stage oncology or we don't do, um, you know, it's, and it's very clear and we're going into all of my moderator questions, but knowing the phenotype of your firm and of the people in your firm when you're pitching will help you find the right people in the right firms to work with. All right, great. So I'm here to pre present NeoFactor Therapeutics. This is not a real company and this isn't real data. 
So at Neofactor Therapeutics, we're developing a best-in-class approach to novel peptides by using computationally designed uh, in silico modeling of receptors and ligand to design best-in-class proteins. We're building off of uh, both cytokine and growth hormone-based platform, which I'll talk about in the pipeline. The lead asset that we're going after is called NFX101 that leverages uh, all of the metabolic benefits of the FGF21 and FGF19 classes combined into a single asset and removing a lot of the liabilities of those assets. Uh, the goal is to have a longer half-life, more potent, um, and more stable uh, compound for the treatment of NASH. And we plan to go into MAN in the first half of 2020. So here's a high-level summary of the platform. We've got a structural modeling of the receptors. So we've modeled out the FGF21, FGF19 ligands, as well as FGF receptor 1C, 2C, 3C, and 4 in order to look at docking of each of these proteins into the receptor to then come up with a new structure that combines the features of both. We've optimized the sequence. We also do in silico modeling to make sure that the constructs that we make, which will be foreign to the body, are non-immunogenic, highly selective, and potent. So the disease that we're going after with our lead asset is NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. This represents a major unmet medical need in the US. Over 50% of Americans are either obese or overweight. And as a result, around 25% of adults have what's called fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver, liver disease, NAFLD. That's around 67 million patients in the US. About 16 million patients in the US will ultimately progress to have inflammation of the liver, steatohepatitis. That's known as NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. When the fat sits around for long periods of time, you get reactive oxygen species. That generates inflammation. The liver then starts to get sick as a result of it. Uh, you end up getting scarring of the liver, and a fraction of those patients will go on and progress to get cirrhosis or full scarring of the liver with end organ dysfunction. Uh, and those then can progress on to getting uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, right now, the number one reason for liver transplant in the U.S. is due to NASH. Uh, this has recently transitioned from hepatitis C since the uh, um, effective therapies of treating the vast majority of patients. So how do we diagnose NASH? We, uh, NASH is actually a diagnosis of biopsy, um, and there's actually two different scoring systems. There's an NAS scoring system where you measure liver fat or steatosis, inflammation and ballooning. And the combination of these three features on biopsy will uh, generate the NAS score. It's a score, score from zero to eight. Separately, you can also look at fibrosis of the liver on a scale from zero to four, where zero is no fibrosis and four is uh, cirrhosis. We can also look at metabolic biomarkers to help tell the picture, um, as well as elevated liver function tests. Um, so FGF 21 and FGF 19 are known to have a variety of metabolic benefits because of the receptors that they target. So FGF receptor 1 is present in the adipocytes and helps mediate sort of peripheral fat mobilization and improve insulin sensitivity. FGF receptor 2 and 3 and 4 are present in the liver and help drive both metabolic benefits and antifibrotic benefits. Uh, FGF receptor 4 in particular is involved in bile acid mobilization or actually reduction of that. Uh, similar to an FXR mechanism, uh, which is one of the most advanced uh, mechanisms in, in development. We've characterized FGF21 and FGF19 head-to-head -head versus our lead asset, NFX101. And what you can see is that the FGF21 mechanism is a little bit more potent on the receptor 1C and the peripheral fat uh, than FGF19 whereas FGF19 has a uh, significant effect on uh, the FGF4 receptor, uh, whereas FGF21 is silent there. One of the key features on FGF receptor 4 is that uh, native FGF19 actually uh, on the FGF re receptor 4 can result in progression of hepatocellular carcinoma. And so what NGM has done uh, very um, effectively is redesign their FGF19 asset, which is in the clinic, to avoid... Uh, STAT3 signaling and avoid the tumorigenic potential. And they've got really beautiful preclinical data to support that. Um, we've leveraged some of their findings along with the native biology to redesign an asset that has high potency across all receptors but also minimizes the um, risk of uh, progression to hepatocellular carcinoma. In addition, um, 
FGF19 has an on-target mechanism of increasing LDL. Um, and with our NFX 101, we've uh, tuned out those features with our in silico modeling uh, Schrodinger co collaboration. Um, so we've tested our lead asset in a variety of uh, preclinical models. We've tested in two different mouse models and then also a Sino model. Um, here you can see uh, in a diet-induced NASH model where we give basically a McDonald's diet to these mice for about eight months. We induce fat, uh, fatty liver. As you can see on histology, the steatosis um, is elevated, inflammation is elevated, uh, ballooning is elevated. And when we compare head-to-head -head versus the um, assets that are, are in the clinic, both FGF19 and FGF21, we see um, better improvement in steatosis and inflammation. When we look at the NAS score, we similarly see that it's just a composite of inflammation, ballooning, and, um, and uh, steatosis. Similarly, on the fibrosis side, we see uh, uh, improved efficacy in reducing uh, the fibrosis score. And what's most important here is you actually see a fibrosis score of two having almost uh, over a one and a half point improvement, uh, which is, uh, we believe, if translated into the clinic, is, is clinically meaningful. In a separate mouse model, this is a high fat, high fructose, high cholesterol diet model. We see uh, dramatic reductions in LFTs, um, as well as a similar reduction in fibrosis score. When we look at body weight, we see uh, around a 10% 10 10 reduction in body weight that's consistent across uh, all the mechanisms. And uh, in addition, we see uh, improvements in uh, glucose homeostasis over time. We've then advanced the acid and tested it uh, with repeat dosing in obese monkeys. And what we see is uh, on par reduction in triglycerides with NFX 101 and the FGF 21 mechanism, uh, as well as on par reduction in, uh, in glucose in monkeys. We're now advancing this asset into patients. We're going to start out with a standard single ascending dose, multiple, multiple ascending dose clinical trial where we'll measure safety, tolerability, PK, and then also get a, a hint for its improvements on the metabolic biomarkers in man. After that, we're going to advance to a phase 2A biopsy study where, or uh, actually this is an imaging study in biopsy confirmed NASH patients where we're going to be testing 90 patients uh, three cohorts, two on drug, uh, one placebo for 12 weeks, where the primary endpoint is MRI PDFF, which is an imaging uh, result looking at the fat fraction of the liver. Secondary endpoints are going to include magnetic resonance imaging, which can look at the stiffness of the liver to help give you insight into, into the fibrosis improvements, change in lipids, glycemic control, fibrosis biomarkers like Pro-C3, inflammation, as well as uh, improvement in LFTs. Behind this uh, uh, lead asset, we have a pipeline of additional assets. We're developing a once-weekly FGF19 um, asset. This is leveraging the great data that NGM has. Uh, they have a once-a-day injectable, and we believe that a once-a-week injectable uh, can be a transformative benefit. We also have a non-alpha IL-2 analog where there's a lot of clinical validation with um, uh, a number of companies out there like Nectar and Synthorix. Uh, and then finally, we've got an IL-2 program for autoimmune disease. Uh, we have a number of issued and pending patents covering both the um, uh, peptide sequences that we've developed as well as the uh, method of use in treating NASH patients. So we're here today to raise, uh, oh, w historically we've raised a $35 million Series A financing at a $150 million post. Um, we uh, are raising $50 million now to fund uh, phase one in healthy volunteers uh, as well as a phase 2A uh, NASH study. Thank you. <laughs> you can come up here. That makes me curious, what's your pre now? <laughs> I, I would like to compliment you on your bias IL-2. Uh, so, uh, so funny. Um, 
uh, curious to to hear more about the team that you'll be developing for a clinical stage NASH asset, a uh, next in class um, oncology program, and then an immunology product. I look forward to meeting your CMO. Um, and uh, I am actually curious around the table how many of our funds have, have debated the endpoint used in NASH. I'm just curious, anyone? So uh, I was to say, you, you, yeah, no? No, that's funny. Okay, so uh, definitely would love to learn more about the post pre and post treatment biopsy associated with the patients in terms of the liver function and fibrotic scores. So would would love to learn more about that in terms of endpoints. And I'll actually iterate. I'll actually uh, touch upon that. So there is actually a big disconnect right now between uh, biopsy data and MRI PDFF data. MRI PDFF right now is really the gold standard imaging agent for an early NASH trial, but the translatability necessarily to biopsy endpoints uh, is, is um, skeptical, so. Um. <laughs> I think a couple of things that would have jumped out to me would be this is an increasingly competitive space, and so what is the bar for what you need to show in the clinic to differentiate your fairly early in development? How do you see the landscape? How would you develop the drug differently as different therapies and different mechanisms become approved. Um, and then for data that looks like that, I'd probably ask a few questions about error bars and whatnot, but then I'd also be like, wow, this, internally, this looks pretty fake to me. <laughs> so I will say we do have those conversations sometimes when data looks incredibly, like most of you are, I'm sure, biologists, uh, when things look that clean and nicely separated and um, no inconsistencies at any point. You kind of start to ask, what other experiments have you done? Have you seen anything that didn't work? Were there models that, you know, you saw? What's your end? And you try to dig a little bit more if you have a little bit of a, this looks too good to be true, because it will be. Are you saying that the drug you're developing is going to make the one that we invested in obsolete? <laughs> Both, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> So I will, I will emphasize here that a lot of people come to pitch to us uh, and to other VC funds without looking at their portfolio companies and knowing what they have invested in before. And so y y sometimes you could be insulting the person sitting across the table from you. So just know your audience, know what they invested in before so that you go in there informed. Yep, so on the competitive landscape, that's, that's sort of where I honed in. And, you know, I think the best pitches... Um, they take the data that they have, and especially if they're benchmarking their preclinical data against, um, you know, things that are ahead of them, either preclinically or clinically. There's a very clear narrative about why the why the better performance, and, and in some assays they were better, in some assays they were equal, right? Why the better performance is going to enable you to have a better outcome in the clinic, um, and what we understand about each of those measures and how they contribute to therapeutic effect. And I think the in a crowded landscape, and we, I think that that's the hardest thing for us is when somebody comes in and says they're going after either the same target in a different way or a different target, but that could be in a similar pathway, is help me understand why that's going to translate to something different in the clinic. Um, and if you don't understand that, getting some people that can help you just decreases the activation energy for us on the other side of it where we can start pressure testing at least some of the assumptions you gave us rather than sort of sitting there saying, I don't really know how this is going to translate to something better in the clinic, because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to triangulate to. So what she's saying is, is this difference clinically meaningful? It's exactly that's right. A real, that's a really important so, feature. So it's different, and, but, but is it is meaningful? That clinically meaningful, yes. I'm in agreement with everything said before me. Yeah, I think your audience can tell you that they're 
telling you to move on. Uh, but it can be an area that they're not familiar with. So uh, you don't want to make too many assumptions there because you can lose your audience very quickly too if you're not giving sufficient background. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, do, I will say we do occasionally have content maps come over. They're like, well, we know about da da da. I'm sure they just shake their head like, we know about da da da. Like, how many member signs are there? We know all of everything. So yeah, no, I think you want to have those slides and presentations go through them, but it is more comical to go on if it's in that. And yeah, we'll often just say like, we know the background of this space, we know the competitive landscape, you can move on. But you should include, uh, so one of the things that wasn't included at all is competitive landscape, which is incredibly important to really be able to, to highlight and differentiate. Um, so you can be prepared to present it, but also be flexible to move on. The other thing that can be frustrating is you tell someone you know about a space and yet they still wanna spend 20 minutes telling you about it. It also reflects on you. Um, and maybe I know the space, but, but it always helps me to hear from you how you think about the space. And it helps me understand sort of the founding team's caliber as well. And as part of diligence, we're gonna under, it's gonna help us understand you know, where the team's strengths and weaknesses are. So I think it's, it's important to include, and if we're getting bored, we'll, we'll let you know. Uh, lots of teams uh, come in and um, they only know about their little company and their little space. Um, and um, what happens is, like for example, in the uh, in the uh, CMC pitch for uh, for gene therapy. So the idea would be for everyone to follow the space that they are in, so that they will know what are the key questions investors suffer from, like what what is painful to them. So they would put that in the pitch to alleviate that pain. So for example, with the CMC you should put up front, hey, you know, I know that everyone in gene therapy is really worried about this. Well, I know the space, I know what's, cons what's your concern, I will tell you up front. So just follow the space that you are in so that you can anticipate what questions would come from us. Yes, I have a question about reimbursement, right? So in a space like NASH, reimbursement is going to be a concern, and might be quite far down the road, but would you, address that objection? Yeah, pricing is a huge debate. Uh, pricing and diagnosis. So a lot of people are anticipating you're gonna have to buy up some patients to get a diagnosis, and then how much is it worth? Diet and ex 90 percent, you know, if you lose 10% body weight, 90% of patients will actually resolve their NASH. And so then there's a big question around, um, you know, how much should a therapeutic cost? I would say on, for in our firm, we're less interested in funding a companion diagnostic and we leverage sort of the technologies that are out there because that's another hurdle to overcome, but I don't want to speak on behalf of the other people here. Um, but being aware of pricing issues and um, kind of hearing your th the perspective of the company is valuable, uh, but you don't have to necessarily have a solution for it because it's sometimes it's not practical. For example, you know, leverage the diagnostic capabilities that are out there um, and see how your program will fit into that paradigm. Uh, in the case of NASH, uh, since pricing in, is an issue, emphasize how your drug will be priced lower than all of the other ones. What's special about your CMC, et cetera? Yeah, so that was going to be my next question. What about access, right? Just the access to the product itself. Um, and do you, does it make sense to paint a picture commercially or stay away from it because it's too early? I think, again, it, it comes back a bit to um, what your goals are with your business. Um, and I, I think we all, just as we talked about the nature of um, picking the fund that you want to work with, I think there's some entrepreneurs who very intentionally are setting up their company for an asset sale. And so the question about um, a small company, and I think that there's very few companies that are funding their own NASH registrational trials, partially because it's a little bit of an extension to diabetes, and so I think arguably the, the required capital to get through that on a reimbursement basis is big. And so um, I think that uh, regarding access, um, I think a lot of the early stage funds are looking for extremely differentiated products as a result of concerns and access and that's the way that we get around having to get into the details about contracting and rebating. Um, very rarely have I seen a company truly understand this, the depth of rebating contracting and how that works in a commercial org and I think that's because most of our companies never get there. 
And so um, almost all of our companies, even if they get close to market, are usually acquired by the time that they are commercialized. I think that there's a few rare opportunities where a small company can become a credible threat. Um, but I think understanding with a commercial mindset is super important in a contracting and discounting world because it will determine whether or not you're acquired. So um, I would say you'd want to understand the parameters. I'll give just a, one example and I won't, I won't keep going. But um, in autoimmune disorders, there's a lot more contracting and rebating that's going on in, in the moment. And so I think the cost of goods sold associated with biologics is becoming increasingly important. So if you think about um, discounting of Humira or a discounting of an IL, you know, an IL-20, anti-IL-23 antibody versus an, in, you know, integrin anti, you know, uh, gosh, name your favorite. There's, there's like six or seven antibodies in these spaces. And so if everyone's discounting and they have huge cost of goods, it actually really matters. So um, I think that matters for your takeout and you need to think about it. But I, I would say that um, most of us are investing in what we think will be a transformational standard of care. And so as long as your cost of goods sold work and you can enrich for the right patient population, it'll show a dramatic effect. I think we all hand wave a fair amount on really the blocking and tackling of managed care. Uh, that's not the first three hurdles that we're facing unless we're buying a registrational asset. So we're far more focused on the science and differentiation early on. I actually don't know if I understand the question. Can you can you clarify, please? So, so, like, and, so, so you know, as a startup, if you're trying to get investment from uh, from VCs, uh, and you have, for example, a new compound that's new for you know, for example, the traction of EGFT, yeah. it, they, it, it's declared an FDA-based new therapy, uh, and you found a clinic that does that wants to work with you and collaborate. How would you sort of evaluate that in terms of is this a fundable company or a fundable project? Yeah. I don't think that's I think he's asking whether if he has already found a clinic, would that be a positive thing in your evaluation of the company? Like is that what you're asking? Like, yes. like, 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 I think of them as advisors. I, maybe um, I in, I think it's super important if you think about hyper orphan indications in which there's a central referral where if you don't get certain names, you actually cannot recruit a trial. But, um, and I think that there's some luminary names that are associated with the person that you may, you may want on a podium associated with an indication and if they've decided to become the lead PI on a trial, I think that's, can be meaningful. Um, I think similarly there are investigators who are associated with like 40 to 50 companies and if we see their name on, on a deck, it doesn't carry the same weight at times. Um, but I would say that uh, I think that it determines on, in my, my experience, the, the importance of having that name associated with the treatment paradigm and if they are a standard of care defining um, physician and the need to recruit. Um, but otherwise, I don't think of it as much. I, I kind of think of them potentially just as advisors um, because you probably will need a number of other sites to be able to re recruit in, in most circumstances. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, it, it depends on the disease. Um, so there are rare diseases where eight patients worth of data can be extremely telling. Um, and so it's very disease specific, I would say, right? So um, broad, big oncology, probably not. Genetically defined rare disease, probably. And the FDA will approve a drug on, on biomarkers and, and tiny numbers of patients. Um, so I think it, it really depends on, on where you're going and what your registration uh, and regulatory path is, um, whether that's um, a strategy or not. And it's something that I would diligence and do properly. And, you know, you, what you don't want to do is just kind of like five patients in big oncology and see some signal and say that's worth anything because any investor is going to look more closely at your preclinical data, your IND enabling studies, the quality of the molecule, and then design the right study to get the right data. So it really just depends. Yeah, I think on the it depends side, I think whenever kind of I different kind of iterations of this, we'll be looking at it, evaluating the asset in the context of the indication and, and the, the design and the data. So I don't think there's like a cookie cutter answer to it. And then the second part of it would be, you know, picking the right investors to talk to because I think, you know, for, for us, we tend not to do single asset companies. And so something like that probably wouldn't be a fit for our model, but could be a fit for someone else. So I think it, it really depends on, on the situation. Yeah, it's, it's really um, take us through your reasoning. What are your assumptions? What are the assumptions that you built in? And then what are the data sources you use to, um, you know, build off of those assumptions? And it's a one slide, you know, one minute thing that should be easy for to explain. And then if you come up with a different number, you know exactly why, right? Or at least you're guided to why. And if your assumptions are reasonable um, and we use different assumptions, then that's okay. We, we can all get to the right place. And if you don't know, that's okay. That's better than, than coming in and saying, you know, Nash is huge and the market's, you know, 20 billion for us in three years, right? So. All right, so we're going to do this in two, um, two flavors because actually the people up here um, have, have roles in venture capital but have also started and built companies and so the first set of questions are for them at, in, their, in their venture roles with their venture hats. So it's from the entrepreneur's perspective what they would ask of a VC. Um, and then I'm going to switch it a little bit and ask the folks up here who've taken entrepreneurial roles sort of the questions um, from a VC uh, perspective and, and from their perspective raising capital um, how, they, how they've done it successfully. So, um, so the first one is from the entrepreneur's perspective You've put together this great pitch. Um, you know, you, you read Kanan's beautiful, like, how to make a slide deck thing, and you, and you did it, and you feel great about it, and now you've got to send it out to VCs. Um, and what you're hoping is that they read it and they um, ask for a meeting. So how do they get your attention? How do I get your attention if I'm that person um, and get that meeting? And what are you looking for? And I guess we'll start over here. Yeah, so from my perspective, I think it's always helpful to have a short description of what the company is going after. Uh, if it's a platform company, uh, just a high-level summary. If it's an asset-focused one, what the assets are and what the stage of the company is. And then for me personally, although I, I might be different from everybody else, I would like to have a non-confidential deck in that initial email. Saves back and forth. I can then open the deck. I can flip through it. 
hopefully there's enough data in the presentation to give me a sense if it's a strategic fit for the firm. I don't necessarily judge if the science is good or bad because oftentimes it takes some <coughs> explaining, but is the stage a fit? Is the uh, you know size uh, fund of the fundraising uh, a fit and so on? And then from there, I will then respond and say, this looks like a great fit. Let's have a non-con conversation and then follow from there. I would say if the biggest challenge is if there's too thin of a intro email, it often gets pushed aside because I just can't prioritize it one way or the other. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think one thing that I look for is kind of the problem statement and a clear description of how your technology addresses that in a differentiated way. And I think, you know, we, we're all looking for, you know, kind of the uh, diamond in the rough, if you will. So I think if that's well captured, with diligence we can fill out the rest, but I think that's a big part of figuring out whether it's worth uh, taking the next step. I think for us, we're, so Sofanova is a little later stage. We're typically not the first uh, institutional investor, so it's a little bit of a different process than when you're doing kind of new company creation, although we've done some of that. So what Rich said is spot on to how we work as well, but typically warm intros help a tremendous amount to get our attention. So if any of these people sent me a company that they're like, this is so cool, I will absolutely take the time and meet with them. Um, so that really helps, especially as we talked about repeat teams. So that goes for you know my colleagues up here, but also we worked with entrepreneurs or they have a colleague that they recommend us talking to, then that usually guarantees at least an initial meeting. All right. Um, okay, so you did the first meeting, so yay, yay for me, I'm the entrepreneur here. Um, and um, what, what happens then? So I think to avoid us all repeating, because I think our processes are fairly similar, I'd love for sort of one of you to maybe go through just what a typical investment decision process looks like and comments about how how an entrepreneur can help you get through that and be efficient in your work, because I think that's something that people don't necessarily have a line of sight into. So maybe with JJ, talk about your investment process, um, and we can go into how entrepreneurs can help you be efficient from there. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, uh, we do a lot of company builds, and so uh, we're first thing digging into the science um, and essentially having access to all the information that we need to evaluate the deal uh, is what kind of makes it go faster and how the entrepreneur can help us. So in the beginning, it's uh, a lot of times just a lot of the papers that are relevant, the background information, um, and then uh, as we dig in, uh, I think just having uh, ready the questions you, you, you can probably expect that we're going to ask uh, with regards to your project. I mean, I think you know every deal is different, so we're pressure testing different aspects. We're, we want to reference the team. We want to you know uh, pressure test the the plans. But um, I think essentially just quick turn turnaround times um, is what helps us make a decision. And later stage firms, anything different to add? So I can go through just what a processes vary. So we usually have, so it's a little different because we're not looking for necessarily the science or talking to universities. So typically we meet with a company, uh, maybe it's one or two partners meet with the company and then we internally debrief. We think, oh, maybe there's a couple of things, the diligence that upfront seem like we try to go for you know, what's going to make this not fit for Sovanova or what is, what's going to highlight the risks, right? That's what we're constantly worried about. What are the things to be most concerned about? And let's try to see if we can get comfort with those. So maybe we do a little bit of work. We have a couple of follow-up calls or meetings on specific diligence questions. And then, uh, and every firm will have a slightly different process. We then bring a company to our full investment committee in which they present to our full partnership. This is probably after we've had maybe three to five meetings with the company, maybe talked to some key opinion leaders, we did a little bit of diligence but not finished it. They present to our firm and then what happens is after that, um, so a day like today where we have two companies come in to present to our full firm and then we have an internal process where we all sort of give some sort of rating of 
we should put a full deal team on this and really flesh out these diligence questions to uh, I feel a little bit neutral and ambivalent about it to I think we should absolutely pass and stop working on this immediately. So we have those discussions. Uh, sometimes they go in two seconds because everyone's on the same page. Sometimes those discussions can take on a bit more time. And then typically the key diligence questions are highlighted for the team to then continue to work on. We are continuing to work with the team during this full, the management team the entire time. Uh, and then we usually come back to our investment committee with updates on this is what we found out, here's the comfort, this is what we'd like to do, and then you finally get sign off. And that official sign off is very different for a little bit different in each firm, but that's mostly the process. So certainly being responsive is really helpful, being open-minded and back and forth. Uh, we're not necessarily here to completely change plans and tell you what to do. We want a team that we defer to, but it's a great also time to get to know the team. We, as Julie and others have mentioned, we work so closely with our management teams. We talk to them so frequently. It gives, it's a, it's a bit of a, to put in Julie's uh, analogy, it's a bit like dating, right? You're kind of getting to know, can we have tough conversations together? Are you responsive? How do you handle feedback? Are you someone I want to work with? Are you someone I want to talk to all the time? Because that becomes a big part of our daily life. And so if every conversation is uncomfortable or c confrontational, you're kind of like, life's too short. Like, no, nobody wants to do it. So that's part of our process. Great. So yeah, I think um, it, very similar for us is uh, diligence is, is technical, but it's a, it is also the window into the people, right? And so. It's really twofold, and I think people often forget that it's not all about the technical. We're asking technical questions, or we're asking market questions, or we're trying to come up with a clinical development plan that makes sense, or a budget, but how you participate in that discussion is going to be a direct lens into what the next 10 years of discussions are going to be, and so it's a way for us to understand what that's going to be like, and, and frankly, it's a way for you to understand if, if the person on the investment team that you're working with is somebody that's that's, that you're comfortable working with. So it's, it's a bit of a two-way street. Okay, um, we had a couple of examples of this already, but I'm gonna throw it out there. Um, during a pitch, what are one or two things that someone, that commonly happens that are pet peeves, that people should not say or should not do that really sour a presentation? Turning tumors from cold to hot. <laughs> Sorry. We have an EIR who calls it throwing a match into an empty fireplace. And so, um, so I, I, I like, tr I, honestly, it's, it's, um, <laughs> I hate to say it's true. Um, so the, the, I, I would say that's, that's one. Um, I think others, uh, uh, honestly, I think that the, just the dialogue, we all want to learn. Um, I, I think that everyone up here, we, we actually know we're not the experts. Um, that's uh, truly, we are, we are generalists, even if we have a PhD in a field, because we haven't actually spent 20 years uh, developing a drug for a specific area. So um, we probably actually have really genuine questions. I would just say assume good intent in the questions. Um, and. I think that sometimes it's really hard when someone is asking questions and they may not make sense uh, to just have a moment of patience with them because um, we could have someone super, super smart on our team and, and they are definitely not asking questions to just test you. I, I would just say that there is 0% chance that someone a is asking a question just to like quiz you. Uh, they probably actually just don't understand. and. Um, and I have ended up on deals that I really didn't understand part of the technology like fundamentally off and we have ended up writing the check because I could have an amazing conversation to become educated by that person. And so um, again, this is part of the process of, of partnership. So um, I think that's the whole like, do you want to spend time in a room with someone because I'm going to be wrong all the time. So can, can we have that conversation respectfully? Um, I would say being overly salesy. Um, it's, yeah, it's very important because on one hand, you do want to emphasize all the great things about your drug and how it is differentiated. On the other hand, you don't want to come across as not being realistic um, and uh, somewhat, uh, you know, 
exaggerating. Um, that's never uh, a good uh, trait in uh, in the people uh, y you would like to invest in. Invest in. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with that last point because I think when we're investing at that very early stage, you know, being very rigorous is important. And so when someone's either salesy or I think the other thing that can happen is they can come off as arrogant if they're kind of dismissive of the competition and other folks' uh, efforts, whether companies or uh, academicians. So I think, you know, making a drug is very difficult and you know we're trying to partner to solve for the problems along the way uh, and if somebody is overly dismissive of kind of everybody else's efforts in the field it makes it hard to have the conversation in a productive sort of way and i'll just to add on top of that if you uh, are aware of the limitations of your technology or platform and you're upfront about it and you say look there is an immunogenicity risk. I've done these studies to de-risk it, but until we dose a man, we don't know. This could create you know, some type of uh, autoimmune response. That's okay, and that's actually helpful because then it gives us perspective that you know where your blind sides are so that you're watching for it because we want to know that you're watching. Um, and sort of just to touch on that theme, it can be frustrating if there's a company that uh, you know, has, let's say, a clinical trial design and we on the investor side are worried that it's, let's say, not powered enough to get a stat sig result. It can be frustrating if the, if the company doesn't express the same concern that we express. Because if I'm worried, I want you to be worried. And if you're not worried, then I'm not willing to necessarily back you because there's a chance that the company could move in a direction that uh, we might see as a high risk um, and walk right into it. All right, um, and so I think from here, I'm going to move to the entrepreneur. Oh, a question. Can I just kind of follow up? Yeah. Um, that uh, it, it's kind of interesting because like, the overconfidence I find that that's what drove the PI that we now have Chakra, um, because I almost always meet um, where I know that the company that I'm going to call on afterwards is maybe not necessarily my It's a wonderful comment. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had I had a question uh, down here, and I I didn't ask it because um, because we'd sort of covered it a little bit, but but it is relevant to your comment, which is, you know, what are the most important qualities for a founding team? And while not being arrogant is one of them, you're also sort of looking for somebody who's going to run through walls, um, and so there is this very fine line because. Um, I think entrepreneurs and founders and CEOs are a bit delusional, and you kind of have to be, right? I mean, I saw Julie raise an amazing round for a company she's been driving, and, like, she's a little maniacal, and, like, she got it done. Um, and, and it's a great outcome, right? And so you do need people to be, to have so much belief in what they're doing. Um, I think on the other side of that is can they come down to earth and have the conversations um, with with their own teams, with their investors, you know, with BD groups, acquirers, the partnership types of discussions, can they come down to earth, right? And so it's, it's flipping between those personalities um, that's really important, um, at least for the ones I've, I've seen, and I will let others comment. Um, so uh, we have a lot of women investors up here, so I, I think this is actually a really great time to just talk about it. Um, so... Yeah, you're right. Uh, I, 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 I like. I'm sitting here slapping my knee because it's a, it's actually um, culture shifting, right? Uh, we're we're culture shifting all the time. And it's it's funny because you probably even have seen us do it up here. Because I I'm laughing at myself because I'm like chatting with Sarah and we're hanging out and we have a dynamic of talking with each other. But like, if I walk into Orbimed, I am wearing a black suit. I am wearing pantyhose. I am wearing <laughs> pumps. Okay, so like. I have, when I was fundraising, I had five outfits. I put them in my trunk. 
Okay, so I knew the uniform of every fund. And uh, that sounds really stupid, but I actually told my CMO when to wear a tie. Um, it is really subtle, but it's actually the subtlety of the language of understanding the fund in which you operate. And um, it is, if you are able, and I think it isn't just about gender, I think this is actually about everyone, and you can still be completely authentic to who you are and show up and understand how to have that conversation with someone. So um, I think uh, listening and being open to comments about data and having the openness. I actually find the best scientists I've ever worked with in my life are um, incredibly humble about data because they've been burned so many times. Um, so the people that I know in our portfolio who have drugs that are on the market that treat hundreds of thousands or millions of people are probably the most humble, but they're very um, principled. And so I think what Mira is talking about is like when it comes to the three pillars of your company, whatever that is that you think defines why it will succeed, I think you need religion. And if you don't have that fundamental belief that you are different because of X, Y, and Z, and that is going to be why you have utility in the clinic, um, I, I think that's hard to own that confidence because you really have to believe a certain set of assumptions that will lead to differentiation. Um, but I think the language of how you show up with gender um, is really complicated. It's, it's really complicated how you disagree, what type of tone you have, in which audience. I think age is subtle. I actually think age is the more complicated aspect of this in our industry. Um, so I, I am constantly a student of trying to learn how to do that. I think fundraising has made me a lot better at it, to be honest. Um, and I think it's very multidimensional. I, I don't know how to fundraise from a Chinese fund. I would really need to learn how to do that. Um, it's incredibly complicated for someone like me, similarly really going to a Japanese pharmaceutical company. I am, I am probably offensive and I don't realize it. So I, I actually ask people in our portfolio who are entrepreneurs about advice all the time. Um, and I try to open that door, especially in today, it's very awkward to talk about these things, but I, I try to open the door because people won't share the advice unless you ask. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit, but it, uh, yeah, it's, it's really hard. So we actually had, this, this seems like a, um, issue on top of mind. We just had a three hour internal training on uh, unconscious bias. And so we are trying, at least as a firm, and just because there are a lot of women on this stage and it's not just gender, it's age and race and a number of other things, we're all uh, guilty of some sort of implicit bias. Um, women against women, you know, people of color with, it's the, we're all guilty of it. And so we are certainly trying to be able to be more aware of this and then make this an action item of how do we better make sure that we're judging new investments in companies on predefined criteria so that we're not as influenced by these things. But to your point, it's still an ongoing problem and it's hard to walk that line and for people of you know younger CEOs and so on and so forth, there's a battle to try to uh, you know, walk the line of being confident without being overly confident, depending what group you're going to, they're going to perceive you differently because of X, Y, Z. That shouldn't really be relevant, but obviously makes it influence. So stay true to fight the good fight. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question, and I think it is probably pretty different amongst each person, each uh, firm that we're at. So at Venbio, we have five investment professionals and one venture partner. Uh, we uh, actually did this analysis through fundraising. We looked at about 800 companies uh, in the last two years. We went under CDA for around 150 of those companies, and we make about four investments a year. So it gives you sort of the sheer magnitude of deal flow, detailed diligence under CDA and ultimate, you know, so eight over the last two years. Um, and 
we typically do a lot of the initial work amongst ourselves, and then we will leverage our network. So if it's a small molecule, we will hire a small molecule chemistry expert to do that review. If it's a biologic, we'll have a biologics expert look at CMC. We do a series of KOL calls uh, based on both physician and scientist expertise in an area uh, to get up to speed in standard of care, um, landscape, and so on. And then we actually have uh, a network of pharma partners. So we'll call our pharma friends and say, is this a therapeutic area that you're interested in? Um, what sort of clinical data would get you excited about uh, acquiring our companies? Um, and uh, that's sort of yeah, high level summary. Yeah, we have, uh, I think, nine folks on the investment side. And uh, our, our fund, uh, it, it's a $700 million fund that we just closed. And it's allotted for 12 investments uh, that we plan to make over about three years. Uh, we actually don't do a lot of deal flow. Uh, we uh, get some, but it's usually from our network. And we also look for areas of uh, interesting emerging uh, biology and kind of educate ourselves, find the, the key opinion leaders as well as just leading scientists <coughs> in the area and uh, have the conversations to see where there might be a company to be formed. Because we're not doing as much deal flow, we have kind of the time to start digging into uh, things and, and form up a business plan with, with the scientists. Um, another part to the question? Yeah, we do, we do both, so maybe a little kind of hybrid. Um, so Canaan's about 90% Series A right now. It's shifted over time. Um, we are probably going to form on the biopharma side. So we're tech and healthcare. We're 60% tech. And I mean like consumer, enterprise, security, marketplaces, fintech, aerospace. Yeah. So, and it's, it's fun. Um, and I am definitely not the expert. On those products. Uh, so the healthcare team, which we do almost all the diligence associated with the healthcare products, that's, I'd say, 75% to 80% life science. Um, and of those, we will probably incubate, my, my guess is somewhere between 15 to 20% of the deals in the fund. Um, and then we will trade with the other Series A funds or syndicate with them to do the formation. Um, and we will hope that entrepreneurs that we have worked with will call us, and that will probably be at least two to three deals in the fund. And then there's the ecosystem of the network of decades that people have worked together, and that will usually make up the remainder. Um, I think that there's very few fun investments where we don't have either a relationship to the investor or the relationship to a C-suite executive. Um, and so... The, the tightness of the people is actually the, probably the biggest theme. Um, I don't remember exactly our numbers, but I'm pretty sure just anecdotally, the majority of the deals are either with a repeat investor that we have done an investment with, or a repeat founder that we have done an investment with, or a repeat scientist we have done an investment with. And so there's a lot of new, but it's kind of, kind of two degrees separated. Um, so it's still actually very close, more than I had realized from the outside. Um. So for 5 a.m., um, we're a, a fund six, which is what we're investing out of, is 350 million. Um, we will invest in 15 companies. Uh, we invest in five new companies a year. Um, and I think if we look at our deal funnel, we probably look at about 500 that come in through 10 investment professionals, half in Boston, half uh, here in San Francisco, layered on those 10 investment professionals are about six or seven venture partners. And I call these people who've actually been successful in the first career of their lives, uh, which are great academics, um, folks who've built and run companies, or folks who've had really successful pharma careers. And that's because those are all the things and those are all the pieces um, that we need to, um, to help companies um, start and grow. So of the 15 companies that um, we'll invest in in a fund, so obviously five a year takes three years, um, five will be new company creation, so a paper, a PI, so there's flavors of that at Canaan. There's a lot of that at TCG. Um, there's, um, you know, maybe third rockish. Um, five of those will be what we call leverage seeds, where the company's already been formed. There's a small entrepreneurial team. 
but it still needs seed financing, so single digit millions to get to some in vivo proof of concept or something that we define as a, a proof of concept. And sometimes that's just, you don't know what indication you're going into. Like there needs to be a business plan, a strategy. And so we'll incorporate all those into a seed to then get to a series A. And when we do those series A's, we love to go out to our friends. We syndicate everything we do and we love for them to lead it as validation that we're not drinking our own Kool-Aid. Um, and, but then of course we, we wanna come into that round as well. Um, and then the last third are straight up series A investments. So somebody else's ideas that they've brought to us, that Canaan's brought to us, that, that other firms that TCG's brought to us, um, where you know definitely not, uh, no not invented here mentality. Um, there's a great team in place, there's a great strategy in place, there's probably some building that needs to happen that we can help with and we'll do those. Okay, yeah, any other, sorry, I guess, did you answer number of check writers? Do we have, anybody? We have uh, 10 people on our investment committee, so there are 10 investors, and uh, we see per year somewhere between four to 500 deals a year, and we all sort of source and work together um, on that front. Uh, six check writers, and we're gonna end up with probably about 22 to 24 companies, including seeds that may or may not convert scientifically, which are, you know, 500K to 2 million, um, and that's just on the healthcare side. So you can kind of think about it as three to four deals per person in three years. So that, that gives you kind of a sense of where the pacing is. Uh, the tech side is a slightly higher pace, higher velocity in terms, but it's generally about three to four, sometimes with you add seeds, four to five deals in, in three years. All right. Any other questions? from the VC perspective before we ask some of the questions from the entrepreneur's perspective. Yes. Just curious about the valuation. So you, you're discussing how much money to put in the initial investment. It has to come from somewhere. And then you have to decide how much of the company that money is worth. Can you talk about where those numbers, how that's a, how uh, an entrepreneur should mm -hmm. think about that and what yep. happens? Um, so I both important numbers. Um, so I think there are two boundary conditions when you think about how much you're gonna raise, and let's use a Series A as an example. Um, the question is always, what are you trying to achieve on that financing, and how much money is it going to take you to do that? So some of it is bottoms up, right? So for a Series A financing, a lot of us would say, we wanna see clinical data, clinical proof of mechanism, clinical proof of concept, okay. What does that take? And so that requires some understanding of your development, preclinical and clinical development plan, some pressure testing. Oftentimes companies don't have a great handle on that. We're happy to work with companies on that and decide sort of the right, the right size, right? And so it really, for us, is built to what you're trying to achieve to generate value for the next round of financing. Um, the second is, is it the right size for the funds, right? And so I think the point was brought up here that sometimes somebody's gonna pass on, your, on the investment um, because it's just not a strategic fit and that might be indication that might be whatever it can also be size of check So, you know 5 a.m. As a 350 million dollar fund if we're all making 15 investments and you do the math through the life of a company We want to put 25 to 35 million to work per company single-digit millions in the seed 10 some in the a reserving for follow-ons bigger funds may have bigger requirements smaller funds may have smaller requirements so where you fit if you determine that that's the right number and your investor determines the right number, the third part of the equation is, does it fit with their fund and their, their actual model? Um, and then I'll let someone else talk about valuations, which is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Look, so I think that's dependent on stage therapeutic area. If we look at comps, uh, mostly, and so it has to do a lot with the market. I mean, if you look at the deals that are getting done right now, it's getting pricey on both the private side and the public side. It's driven on sort of what's M&A activity, what's the public market look like. Um, and then we all, yeah, everyone on this, I'm like thinking through maybe the numbers thing. No, everyone on this firm actually comes from really disciplined, we're long-term investors. We are not the type of group that puts something in while market's hot and we can imagine getting a return in six months. We will be in this through market cycles. So that makes us very disciplined of we want to be there to develop and build value alongside of the team over a long period of time. So we've been in a bubble for a little bit, for quite a bit. And so I think we still try to be disciplined to think about different scenarios and making sure that we can all get our own multiple and each fund will have a different number for what that bar is. 
um, to get a deal done. And so it's kind of a squishy answer, but it really is just market dependent, how competitive the deal is, so on and so forth. Yeah, it's, um, I'll say there's public market comps, right? Uh, and if, I, I actually recently had a, co a conversation about this with one of our portfolio companies, which I think is the forward-looking construction of multiple rounds of financing. I think there's very few startup companies that actually do it, and I think it's super smart, if you can, uh, just to model the cap tables of your seed, your A, your B, your MES, your, you know, your IPO, your secondary. Because um, we do it, I, I, I'm sure. So, and we're trying to make sure we don't run out of money. And so, um, sounds super basic, but we, we are afraid of running out of money. And so, um, the, the way that we think about it is if we max out generally at 25 and are trying not to end up with a portfolio construction where we're overextended on a single company, um, we will project forward towards to exit and liquidity, and liquidity for us is cash back. And so, um, we'll calculate the pre-money for the money that we need to get into the first round into the company to get to the multiple that we need to get at for, the, it, for it to make sense. And um, the way that that can work is we will look at public market comps for an asset and where we'll end up, say, the Series C or the IPO or the M&A. And then we will calculate back the dilution that will happen to us as the in incubating fund or the Series A. And we will then think about how that lines up with our cash. So it's backwards math to get to evaluation. Um, I think that's probably really different than how, say, a public market investor will work where there's a lot of comps. Um, and you'll see a lot of patterns about step-ups on crossover rounds to public rounds and expectations on those step-ups, which are kind of lockstep often. Um, but I think it's harder to predict what will happen in the public market for a lot of these companies and kind of which ones take off and which ones don't. And I hand it to my crossover friends to be much more fluent about this than me. But um, we're trying to make it work in a range of scenarios to make sure we can get to a certain threshold, but also really to make sure we don't run out of money. And uh, I'll comment on some of the really early stage companies because that's a lot of the investments that uh, TCG makes. Um, I think, you know, uh, as folks noted, uh, it is partly market determined, but one of the things that we uh, bake in there is for the amount of money that we're putting in, there's, there's a company build uh, that's projected and the hiring plan that goes with it. And uh, as part of that, uh, we'll build in uh, the option pool and all that to uh, hire those folks, and that will help project what the pre-money has to be to accommodate uh, the growth of the company. I think for the founders, um, it, it's a little bit more of a dynamic of kind of how hot the area is, how far along the assets are, uh, and kind of the probability of success uh, that we see uh, going into it. I know it's kind of a fuzzy answer, but it, I think it's kind of triaging a lot of different things and a little bit of a gut instinct on, on uh, how positive people feel on it, I think is also a factor in, in figuring out how much people want to get into it and how much uh, folks are willing to pay. Yeah, maybe I'll add on. We, we often at our partner level, before anyone can write a final check, will do a QC, irrespective of sector. So like, I will do this for aerospace deals, which is, um, what do you need to believe? And so, um, we will go back, and, and we've walked away from deals at this stage in conversations, honestly, which is you need to believe that this asset raises $200 million at a $500 million pre and then exits at a $2 billion to be able to get $100 million back to the fund. And so, you know, what do you need to believe? And then the question is, how many companies have you seen in the history of the public markets ever do that? And so that very quickly brings an investor back to reality. And so... Um, the number of $5 billion takeouts in our industry, I could probably say, if you are not a multi-sector commercial organization, you can probably put on that many hands. Okay, so um, as we move down and the normal median takeout of a company is somewhere between 300 and $600 million, unless you're an exception, 
that helps us think through if you have to raise $100 million or $400 million to get an exit, the math gets weird. And so um, we think a lot about in a normal world, in normal math, our job is to return principal. And so, and, and to be clear, we're, we're investing pension funds. And so we're investing out of endowments and we have to get the cash back. And so uh, we, we very much, I'll speak for Canaan, focus on what do you have to believe to get cash back? And, um, and that actually often comes into a lot of the conversations around pre-money, which may have something very different than the inherent value of the asset. It, it's actually um, just math and comps. And just one note on comps. So as I'm thinking about, for example, Avexis, right, which was acquired for $9 billion, or Spark, which was just acquired for $5 billion, you then see gene therapy companies, and there are trends absolutely in spaces where there's justification for large takeouts that will be a high number, but coming in with any gene therapy company and then just citing Spark and Avexis as your comp, and this justifies, and I've literally seen this, like a 500 million pre for a company that's two years from the clinic is also shows a lack of sophistication and we can't trust that we'll ever get a $10 billion exit. That is not how we build our models. Um, so just be careful about the comps that you do use. CNS, right, you think about Denali and Elector, like those are great companies, but you have to also think about all the companies in the space to really come to a comp that is reasonable. And I think speaking to a little bit the difference between the funds, when we evaluate something, because we take something on pretty early and then uh, we're putting a decent bit of capital to work, uh, or when we look at a potential deal, can that deal return the whole fund? And so the multiples that it needs to have the potential for, because we, we take such concentrated positions, um, yeah, it's just different between funds. So we're a little later stage, so we take on a little bit less risk, so we can take a little less ownership because we think we're more likely to get more returns from more of our companies, but probably not as high as some of these groups that will take on the earlier risk and go a little bit bigger. So it, it depends which one you're talking about. I have a question about um, recognizing the science itself. So uh, we saw Matt Nelson from GSK go over to Deerfield recently and and he, he, a lot of his papers about genetically validated targets. And so, you know, how much are you using um, things like big data sets and such to circumstance the science? Or is it more intuitive? Is it more comps and KOLs and things like that? Because I would have to believe that one of the reasons that he went over there was he's bringing back, he's bringing all that knowledge of looking at, you know, basically his, his justification was behind the. 23andMe group, et cetera. So how are you thinking about the tools to evaluate and quantitate the science and kind of reverse engineer that in a, in a computational set, set? We just had this conversation uh, internally about, you know, the role of big data and how that should inform, I mean, what is our strategy in big data, right? And I think we came to this conclusion, which is, um, I don't think we're ever going to build a company around just big data because um, while GSK did the 23andMe deal, they did it because they have the horsepower to actually do all the other things you need to develop a, a drug, right? And, and what 23andMe is bringing is, is some orthogonal data that can help um, identify and validate targets. But then there's all the work of making a medicine. And so I think for us, um, it's, it's probably too early. It's like in a target ID sort of it's a bit early for where for where we would go um, but but we do think more about if somebody comes to us with some oncology targets we'll ask about the human data we'll ask about you know all the databases out there and if you've been able to mine them um, and uh, you know what if, if you haven't we've got plenty of associates who have PhDs very recently who just spent the last five years of their lives doing this um, and uh, are really good at it and so I would say it's one piece that we look at and it can really help us gain confidence, especially when, when it's a new target company. And so often new targets are based on molecular, mechanistic data, animal data, and if we can just point to some human data sets that can either help us understand which indications to go to or just validate the scientific premise, that's really interesting. But we're not building a company around data anytime soon. Any more questions? Yes. I 
think you know w once the investment's made, certainly portfolio companies kind of figure out their own way, and so sometimes there is convergence. Um, so I I think it's not un completely uncommon, say in oncology, that uh, we might end up with uh, companies pursuing uh, the same target. I think at the outset we would avoid it. Um, but if the technology is differentiated enough and if it is something like immuno-oncology where you know, there's probably multiple good ideas to, to try, I think we would still look at it. Or you know, neurodegeneration or, or some of the larger fields. If it gets to a really kind of small area, w we would hope that the uh, one bet that we made can, can cover it. No, I mean, uh, it's under conf confidentiality, so there really isn't. And then also, I mean, this is a reputation, a business that's based on reputation. If you do that as a venture firm, you crumble your entire firm. So we take that incredibly seriously. The other thing I was going to add to competition is you can ask a firm up front, you know, and figure out who the partner is, right? If the partner is on the board of that competitor company, you shouldn't talk to that partner. You put them in, they should not take that meeting, and, and you don't, you shouldn't, but some firms have mechanisms to wall off each other. So just ask them about it. You can have a very upfront conversation on how do you guys handle, because we've certainly invested in um, companies that directly compete. We have a mechanism to deal with that. But some firms will make a decision upfront. We, we won't invest in a competitor company. So just have a direct conversation. Yeah, I agree. a very good question. Um, so it depends on which kind of accelerator or incubator you're talking about. There are the um, there are the J Labs, the QB3 types of incubators. Um, we have great relationships with them. We go and speak there. Um, we um, you know we know every company in those in those um, buildings, uh, and we know them personally. We know the founders personally. Um, because as we said, sometimes we'll wait three years, but we're tracking. We're tracking those companies, and um, when they're ready, it could be you know six months. It could be two years. Um, then there are the um, let's just call them more tech-focused accelerators. Those are tougher for us because they're built on a very different model. So you can sit in J Labs for like three years um, and get your proof of concept data and rent a bench, you know, for a thousand bucks a month, and you know you've got staying power there. Um, tech accelerators really focus on like the minimum viable product model and doing something in six months and that's just not how we work and so we'll tend to see it's not how science works and so we'll tend to see a lot of companies come out of those programs that are way too premature or haven't thought about the right questions and um, even if it's an impressive technology it just sort of lost its way in in that process and so it's not like I don't look at them because I think they're interesting, but oftentimes they've they've just wound up in a place that's that's very different from where we would invest. And so, you know, incubators and accelerators are are those two flavors in, in my world. Um, and uh, you know, similarly, most of those companies in those in those ecosystems have been funded by by angels, and we're absolutely happy to to follow on the the great work that they've done. Yeah, I would I would echo that. Um, the tech side of the house, we're very we're very intentional about. Um, it, this is part of the ecosystem that actually we, that does not exist in healthcare. Um, so there's seed houses that are incredibly focused. So if there was, for example, there'd probably be the equivalent be if there was a seed fund that put 200k in only gene therapy companies, right? Like there's the the tech ecosystem on on capital is just hyper segmented, both by stage and by vertical and by sub segment. So there's just m many more types of funds and, and much more money. And so um, I think that the nature of that kind of uh, baby fish, medium fish, all the way up in tech is just very different. I think the pacing of the incubator to launch and the dynamic of quantitative predictive numbers. Um, and I think this goes back to your big data predictiveness. I think the trouble that we have right now in the world is um, there's 
large data, quantitative data sets that are available for, say, if you're a, you're a hedge fund doing consumer investing. And it's incredibly interesting to see what people are learning. But there is a difference if you are a retail store and you can use visual imaging to see how many cars are in the parking lot. Um, we don't know what causes Alzheimer's. And so um, it is just a forest from trees problem with biology and assays and difference in method on assays that creates so much noise that we have yet to figure out how to use this data. So um, I think that I look forward to a point where we have that predictability on biology. I just don't think we're there yet, right? Um, I hope one day that we have that. But seed investors are, we don't, we just don't have the same ecosystem. Um, it, it really, I don't see it as, as institutional and focused. Um, I don't know. A lot of friends and families and... Yeah, a lot of former r really successful entrepreneurs who will put money into a round. Um, but I, I, I don't know if it's kind of like a fund, right? Like, I do every aerospace C deal in the West Coast kind of thing. Like, it, it's kind of different. Listen, all money is green, guys. So if you can start your company and do do you, what you need to get done for your company, uh, I mean this, you may not need us. Okay, so um, there's kind of something amazing in that, right? Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot. It's just hard for biotech when you need 20 to 60 to 80 million dollars to, to get to a value inflection point. I think that it's harder. Um, I think that the tech ecosystem, you really can bootstrap a company with $2 million and get to some meaningful metrics. Um, so it, if you have friends and family that can get you to 20 million, no, going back to your pitch, like $30 million to get through your phase one for a series A, like maybe you should do that. Um, we just we have a magnitude of capital problem. I think life science tools people can scrap, bootstrap in a different way. Um, I know, I was just saying, I think he was asking how do VCs view it when on your cap table you have a lot of different high net worth individuals and is that what you were asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Okay, so there's for no limit to rows on Excel sheets. I've seen some crazy <laughs> cap tables. <laughs> we're good. Uh, no. I think perhaps different funds view this differently, but the later stage funds don't really like it because it complicates a lot of the dynamics. And also, especially if some of the high net worth individuals um, have some sort of pseudo understanding of what's going on and then they have a lot of demands, uh, things can get pretty complicated. So to the extent that you can get really serious you know, uh, VCs involved early, it would be best. Speaking, you issued a uh, fake of pretty popular, and you issued five million dollars in sales, and you're raising five million dollars from a VC round. So the money is gone basically already, uh, because you um, almost, I guess, issued five million dollars in sales. So I, I'm not sure I understood your question. So if, um, if, if you raise angel capital on a promissory note or something like this, you raise five million dollars, and then you raise a, a your numbers uh, don't add up anymore. So well, hopefully you did something productive yeah, with the five million. Yeah. Five million that you now don't have, you wouldn't yeah. have more than five million dollars in value generated from that. So it's not gone. It's you've used it hopefully to boost the company. Yeah. Right. And, and you didn't generate as much value as the dollar was spent. Sometimes there's a down end, and the shares of the buyer might. And uh, the only comment I would make on uh, the first institutional money in looking at a cap table, usually, you know, it's not, well, I don't know, usually not like 50 <laughs> different people. Um, uh, and 
uh, I think the that can all kind of be handled. It's going to you know affect the free money as long as you created value. Hopefully, the free money goes up because of that. Uh, but uh, I think where it can have a, a distortive effect is uh, if it affects board composition and if you're you're bringing on along folks that were very early investors, but maybe you know not they can't all be, be on the board. And if that's a problem, then it starts becoming a problem for for the VC uh, investment as well. Where I think we pay pretty close attention to board composition. Your time's like about five minutes. Yep, I was just noticing that. Um, so we'll do one more question, and then I'm gonna not ans ask any of my entrepreneur questions except one, um, because I really want to know the answer. So I'll say every firm has a different risk profile. So when you find, kind of know what stage and where you are, and for example, we are much more clinical execution commercial risk, that's where we're willing to take the risk. We're much less biology risk. And then there are a number of examples of companies that we did thorough diligence, we identified these as the risks, and then something completely unexpected <laughs> happens and you have to pivot, and, and that's why teams matter. So uh, there's too many examples to, to go through. <laughs> yeah, I would say that. Uh, and they are so painful. <laughs> Just quickly, uh, one mechanism is tranching, and uh, you should be very familiar with that uh, because you can propose it uh, upfront to your investors. Does Just everyone know what that means? Okay, no. No. Okay, so basically, if you have a Series A of $20 million, well, that $20 million might not be given to you up front. You might say, okay, the venture person might say, we'll give you $5 million to complete this milestone. That milestone might be showing that your mice don't die. Once the mice are alive, we give you another $10 million, <laughs> right? So <laughs> this seems like a weird like ransom, like once the mice are alive, we will deliver <laughs> the rest of the money. <laughs> so that is how we write our term sheets, <laughs> or how we should from well, here on out. Society <laughs> book is the language in like every legal document on that, but it's basically that. Yeah, basically, we just want to make sure that we don't put all the money up front. That's one mechanism. One other mechanism is to make sure that your investment has really low valuation uh, when, uh, when uh, you are getting in, because hopefully you can sell it for just a little tiny bit above, and you know, you might get something out of it. And a few weeks ago, uh, some of the entrepreneurs told us uh, it's best for us to try and cultivate the relationship before it's time to raise the money. Mm -hmm. So, uh, since cold intros don't always get answered, warm intros, if your network isn't built up yet, is difficult. How do we meet you? You're here! <laughs> <laughs> we are going to, we stick around for a little bit, and honestly, the week after we do one of these, I get a lot of emails, and I'm happy to, you know, it, it can just be a note on what you're working on, and you know, that's led to investments. So, you're here. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I got you. So, um, God, uh, it's a really good question. So, my my opinion is, socializing without the context of a deal is frustrating. Um, we all want to go home to our families, okay? So um, call me with a deck, okay? Like um, we have the ability to quadruple book every 15 minutes of our day. And I would take that view that what we want is a really productive relationship. And so um, get the warm intro, 
to be really tactical about it, six months before your first raise, do it with someone who knows the fund, pre-socialize the deals to understand where there's a fit structurally on money and on stage. Like, th those are like the two things that you can get through probably with no meeting, spamming us, and never using a minute of time. And that is your time. And honestly, I think that I love people who send me a note that I, they're like, hey, going to go raise in six months. Here's the pre-read. Is this a fit? Yes, no. And I'm like, why? And then I'm like, great. When do I reach out? And I put it into a CRM database. And then I wait for you to call me. And I think we're all probably kind of similar to that in terms of CRM. But that is the relationship. We have built a relationship. We have a digital relationship. <laughs> you did not waste my time. I do not remember you as someone who forced me to sit with you for an hour when I really desperately have no time. So um, I, I'm not saying that to be rude, and I'm kind of joking, but I actually think literally every VC thinks this way. They just don't say it. And so um, I actually think digital is a super powerful relationship. And I think that if someone who made money for Canaan sends me your intro and we have connected by email, we have a relationship. It's, yeah. that's, I, I think just, it's that light touch. So. And it's not just investors, right? So, for example, it's entrepreneurs. So if you're, you have your own company and you're talking to colleagues or at another, whatever, another company or who've been in this industry for a long time, they have an outreach to us too, and they might be more willing to talk to you if you want to ask them something specific about your company or development or bring them on as a consultant. That's a great way to get to know them. And then they're great people to connect who have sometimes really strong relationships with investors. Okay, so I really want to ask my question. To the entrepreneurs here, um, what is something common that VCs do that you absolutely hate? And do you in your have you in your VC life done it? <laughs> so, so advice for us. What 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 have we done that, that, that you don't like? You just went through the process. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Lisa, do you want to go? Uh, I, I didn't really ask a great because I don't think it's a fun minute, so uh, Okay, so God. Uh, okay, so um, I've raised two series A's. Um, so, I mean, on the road, like, like you guys, uh, I have a very distinct advantage that we are co-investors with lots of other funds. We can probably get a meeting, um, and, uh, really want to continue to invest with all of these people. And I, I literally have to go through the exact same process, but I probably have an advantage to get hello. Um, and for some funds, I sent an email and they said, not a fit. Uh, a, a lot, actually. And so um, I just want to really empathize with that, that, like, actually, it happens all the time. Even when you're a partner at a healthcare fund and you think your company is, like, the coolest thing ever and you've spent 100 hours a week on it for two years. Um, so um, I have peers who ghosted me. It makes me sad. <laughs> and then we go to coffee and we act like it never happened and it just hurts. <laughs> It hurts. It hurts. So, and I remember it, and um, and I like, like I've got to let it go because like you can't you can't hold on to it because I don't know what the heck was going on in their life. Like maybe their mom died. Like you, I I really mean it. You like you never know. Um, and they have a hundred meetings a week, and you know, um, the second is, I think that some funds waste the entrepreneur's time by asking a zillion questions that have absolutely nothing to do with the decision at hand. And um, I have changed the way that I do diligence now. I'm extraordinarily focused on what is the first reason I'm passing? What, is, what do I need to believe in my thesis? What are the top five things? And there's a level of granularity in terms of de-risking an investment that I think is necessary. And then there's a level of granularity that is offensive. And um, if we are getting down that rabbit hole, I have come to realize I should stop the process and leave because they're never going to get there. And so what I've realized is the funds that wrote the checks and the funds that got there on both deals didn't dig to ground zero. 
they believed on the fundamentals of the data that was presented and they knew enough to make that investment and they were educated coming into the room on the field and they were comfortable at the right level of questions and it just fit. Um, and I spent a lot of our time um, answering questions that really were never going to actually get people there. And, um, and I should have shut it off, but I kind of was scared. <laughs> Um, it's, it was absolutely scared to walk away, and I just kept thinking that people were going to say yes, but in, in honest truth, they were never going to say yes. And I probably should have known. Um, and I've been working in venture for six and a half years. So um, I hope that helps, but it, it is exactly like dating. It's like you keep going and you hope that they're going to say yes, and then like you're seven weeks in and you've spent 50 hours and and you're like, oh my God, why are you asking this question that makes no sense? And it, it, that should be the tell that I should just be like, we are walking away, thank you very much. So, yeah, that was my oh, oh, super emotional moment, but <laughs> I'm still like traumatized. <laughs> so, so I, I do do that. And one of the, one of the fields is ghosted. Ghosted, <laughs> yeah, there's the big G. Yeah, you gotta you gotta have like some humor about it. Like we have a lot of emojis. We have a lot of memes on our team. We have a Slack channel um, that we will burn before we're ever bought. Um, but I do think that's really smart. So I'll just say pro tips, and then maybe we'll end. And I'd love to hear from anyone else who's run a process. Um, build three decks before you talk to an investor. You have your non-con, you have your con, and then you have your main body deck for your next set of presentations, and then you have like a s literally 100-page appendix. And you do not send the 100-page appendix. Um, uh, you have a preset data room with everything. You should probably not use Dropbox. I used Dropbox. That was stupid. Um, and so use something other than Dropbox because you can't track who they've sent things to. It's really complicated. So pay for the system. Um, have the tracker. Because it makes it very easy for someone else on your team to be objective about who's actually interested in you. Um, every single time you get an email, and every single time you have a meeting, and you can just plot it. And you understand who's going to lead you around. Or who's digging you into a hole of never-ending questions that is going to waste your time and keep you up until 2 in the morning, and you should stop <laughs> dating those VCs. Okay? So... Um, and if they do not clarify when they are going to put you in front of your presentation, in front of their partners, all of them, literally all of them, they are not giving you the money. They are never giving you the money. Okay? So um, just be super sober about it. And I use charts to try and make it easier for me to say no uh, because it, it got really scary. Right? So um, I wish I had hired a junior person to do turns on 24 hours on presentations. Um, it is incredibly difficult. We did one Q&A document as an experiment, and we started posting into the data room every question anonymized from all of the VCs parallel processing just to see what happens. But as I go to replace myself as a CEO, I know every single question that has been asked of our company in our Series A, and I have all of the counter detail points ready for my Series B. So it is super structured. Um, we had a CRM of who we were going to go out to in wave one, two, three, and four. Uh, we tried to figure out which funds would syndicate with each other in advance and knew who were calling each other. And then we had already talked to our KOLs so that we could ask the KOLs what questions each of the VCs had asked to understand which ones understood the field. So we were trying to figure out who had smart money. And we had all of that lined up before we started. Okay? So, and that's because the minute you go, you never want to be a stale deal. Okay? So, the pre read, the pre shopping, the getting to know everyone, and then dropping into the A and running, you want to run a four month process. So, um, and, and I think on average, I have not seen a deal close ever in, our, in the history of A's to B's, you know. First days, three months. If someone can close in three months, they are like amazing. Um, 
So uh, I hope that helps just in terms of like the, the rigor on it. Get someone operational to support you or you will lose your mind. Um, like get a college aged person, get a task rabbit, get anyone. Um, it, will, it will help a lot. Is that helpful? I do want to leave you with one thing, though. Just remember that the person on the other side is human, and they have their own issues, right? Like within the fund, within the fund, they have a reputation to uphold. They have a certain, you know, um, st stage within their career that they are at. So just be sensitive to that um, and help them uh, because they will be your champion within the fund. Um, and they will stick their neck out in many ways in front of their partnership, in front of their colleagues. When you go syndicate, you know, when you go syndicate, the entire venture community is judging you, who are who the person who's bringing the deal, right? So you have to be supportive of this person and understanding and just remember that they're human and they have their own fears and their own needs and, and, and career aspirations. Entrepreneur. Well, we actually started uh, with uh, uh, kind of pet peeve, and I would say one of them would be when you know they're not doing their side of the homework. If they're going to ask you questions, and then you give them the uh, the, the replies back, and and as the conversation continues, they didn't care that much, which is again digging. Uh, they were kind of just looking for things to push back on. Um, so I think uh, that that and. I think having, uh, and Julie uh, <coughs> referred to this, is having kind of a threshold or where you know, you have clear communication where they're actually a no. Um, they're just trying to be nice and not tell you that exactly, but they are, you know, you need to be able to read the room and uh, know uh, e whether it's on terms or wh whatnot, how hard to push uh, and where there's gonna be give and you have some leverage and where there isn't, and you need to you know, change something, find somebody else, and move on. Yeah, and, uh, so one thing that I've experienced in the past is uh, interacting with investors where uh, you have a data package that you think is compelling. The investor says, uh, if you could generate this extra piece of data, I would be interested in investing. <laughs> you then generate that piece of data and they're still not interested. It, they want the next uh, study because it opens another question and another question and another question. Um, and I'll say, potentially on the investor side, uh, I've been involved in that, but what I try to do is give very constructive feedback uh, and not as specific as sort of, if you generate A, I will do Y. Because sometimes the results of that next study will open another question instead of answering uh, the initial one. So. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>